turning it over to him and to my colleague, Meg Bond. So Victor is uh, a man about town of rare proportion. He has worked with us. We've been blessed to have him work with us in the master's program and in many special programs like this one. He spent years at the Los Angeles Times where he covered everything important, and that knowledge has enabled him to do programs such as the rich piece, I must say, that he has presented to the Murrow Fellows. Victor is also a, a distinguished uh, trainer of journalists in, in many different venues, from Pointer to um, Indian Country. What, what's the training in South Dakota, the Native American? Native American, American Indian Journalism Institute. American Indian Journalism Institute. And he's also an editor at a very interesting site called resnetnews.com. It's R E C dot org. I'm sorry. Yeah. Not a big money maker. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I recommend it to you. It's an important source of uh, news on Native American issues. We are delighted to have Victor as a colleague, and I am very grateful that he has put together such a rich program. And I ask Victor and May to moderate because you all are the ones who know these guys. So I look forward to it. Well, thank you, Geneva. In fact, I was a little worried when I was, when Geneva was saying that the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing your journal in some significant proportions because I thought maybe she was looking over at the food, looking at me, and thinking I'm a journal of significant proportions. Um, <laughs> Actually, also the man about town thing. I happen to know that he's a terrific dancer. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to show you though how 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 we of course, uh, in, as many reporters do balance that professional and uh, dance life. It was that the <laughs> investigative reporter's editor uh, <laughs> But I'm, I'm really delighted to see, uh, see all of you here uh, and also to introduce you to uh, these journalists from Asia and for them to, to get to know some of you. They already have met some of the uh, uh, students as well as some of the faculty uh, with whom they've been speaking uh, to over the, over the last several days. <coughs> uh, the journals here, I'll tell you where they're from in a minute, but they come from, they're part of a program called the Edward R. Murrow Program, which is sponsored by the State Department and, and brings uh, uh, about 150 journalists from around the world to the United States for three weeks, in which uh, they spend the time in Washington uh, uh, speaking to journalists, government officials, um, uh, others in, in, in Washington talking about the federal system of government and uh, national policy. They then go to 10 uh, universities around the country, one of which was US, is USC, USC being um, one of the inaugural uh, programs and universities to host uh, journalists from around the world to come here. And they've spent here, uh, uh, they will spend a little less than a week here, and then we'll go to East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, uh, the idea is going to a smaller place after a large place like uh, Los Angeles, and then ending up in one of the largest places of all, in New York City. Um, in the past few days, let me tell you uh, uh, what they've been doing as well. The journals, by the way, and I hope all of you have been able to pick up uh, Thank you. We've got the journalists from Brunei, journalists from Fiji, Mongolia, Papua New Guinea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, People's Republic of China, Singapore, the Philippines, Timor-Leste, uh, or East Timor, and you know that, and Vietnam. So it's a, a range of countries and news organizations that you see here. Uh, what they've been doing here since the time they've landed in, in Los Angeles and had a welcoming reception in, in here in Annenberg, is uh, talking to some of the professors here about demographic, demographic shifts in Los Angeles and the region. Uh, they've talked to uh, those involved in the Metamorphosis Project and the Alhambra Project, and you know, uh, involving U.S. E. Vandenberg program with, with emerging communities and immigrant communities in, uh, in, uh, uh, around Los Angeles and in South Los Angeles as well. And they spent time uh, at, uh, on Saturday on the weekend, Skid Row, where they, where they met with the uh, advocates of the homeless, uh, community watch people, and they went from Skid Row to Hollywood, 
where uh, they were at a Groundlings Chinese theater, and and, and one of the one of the members of our group mentioned after seeing all the uh, characters, they're all dressed up and everything. Uh, one of the members of our group said, because we've heard about the mentally disabled on the uh, Skid Row, didn't know which was where the crazy people supposedly were, Skid Row or Hollywood. And um, uh, so, and then from Hollywood, they went that evening to, um, to the Ford Amphitheater to talk to the, the director of the Juice Project, which is the Justice United in uh, Creative Energy, uh, which is a program involving young people in graffiti art, in uh, hip hop, in a number of different programs. And so there's a hip hop festival at the Ford Amphitheater. So they met the people there who were behind and producing it, and then watched the hip hop uh, festival as well. And, and I think. Um, uh, some of us learned also that hip hop is international, and that in Hong in China, that uh, there was an international hip hop festival as well. And so, and then they yesterday they were in uh, City Hall talking to uh, political reporters, talking to political consultants, and then going to uh, to the LA Times, where they saw as we went through the newsroom a lot of empty desks. <coughs> And then uh, heard about and talked to the foreign editor at the uh, Los Angeles Times. And then uh, we were encouraged to come into the cafeteria because they could use the revenue. So we did. And, and uh, then went to the uh, Watts Towers to see South Los Angeles and Watts talk to community people there as well. So they've had quite a, quite a, 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 a trip and experience. So I'm, I'm really delighted, as I said, to. to uh, have them meet you, talk to you, and have you ask questions of them when we're talking about the theme of international reporting, especially in the time of, of uh, economic downturn and how they view international reporting in their own countries, how they also are involved in it as well. And we were great earlier to see here from Sandy Cohen and David Westfall, as well as May Fong, uh, in talking to them about it. And May, for some of you who may not know her, is a reporter from the Wall Street Journal and has been in Beijing and has covered Asia and uh, is a, a native of Malaysia and is an award-winning reporter uh, as part of a Pulitzer Prize-winning series. And is now part of the Journal and now, faculty and, and an advisor to the dean. Yeah, okay. Well, hi, everyone. I'll just introduce myself briefly first and then we'll get down to the more interesting part, which is everybody else here. Um, I'm Mei Fong. Um, I'm Malaysian, and I have to say that uh, it's a pretty big world out there. I write for the Wall Street Journal. It's an American publication or a global publication, as you might call it. And um, I have uh, written about everything in Asia, covered starting from and and America too. I also started my journalism career in America, in New York. So I've covered everything from 9/11 to the Olympics, to bird flu in Vietnam, and a lot of other issues too. So we have a, here a very interesting group of journalists uh, from Asia, and they have together a, a very ex in, um, interesting collective experiences here to share with you. They come from places like China, which is, you know, as we all know, a pretty exciting story going on there. Um, one sixth of the world's population, fastest growing economy, yada, yada, yada. Um, Yidong is going to talk more about that in a bit. Um, and we, um, there's Singapore, which, you know, in, in the overseas press has always, um, you know, felt that it hasn't gotten a good representation, you know, since we all think about it as a place with uh, no chewing gum and, 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 uh, oh. <laughs> um, and then there's um, East Timor, which I personally find very exciting because it's the newest nation out there, you know, it's, few years old, it's, it's, it's got lots of exciting things going on, you know. How many of us can say we come from a nation that's less than 10 years old? Um, and um, there's Mongolia, which is, you know, very fascinating. And Sumia is going to tell you something about it that I think we don't know. They're the, and, and, you know, it's not just about the places they come from, but how we link together globally and what, why it matters. That's particularly interesting. So. Uh, we have here some people from, um, you know, the islands, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, who can, you know, tell you a lot about climate change, which is a, a big issue for them and for us too. And then they are the forefront of these kind of issues. And so, 
Um, I would like to perhaps start by, um, I think it would be great if we could have a sort of a quick introduction. And I've asked all these um, people here, and I think it's particularly interesting for us all, not just because some of us are, would like to be foreign correspondents overseas maybe, some of us may be wanting to work for NGOs overseas, some of us may actually come from some of these places and want to see some more um, interesting discussion about them. I've asked each of them to pick one issue that um, hasn't really been covered and it's a really interesting dynamic that um, represents something fun about their country um, that could either link to something global or be really interesting on just to let you know what it's all about. So maybe we'll just start and we'll be a little bit informal about this. So let's uh, do that and everybody can jump in. I, we were just talking now about Mongolia, Sumia, and um, you know, you want to tell them a little bit about what you said about why there are so many misperceptions about Mongolia. And um, everyone, kind of speak a little bit louder because it's a big, big space. Sumia. Yeah. Well, when uh, we talk about the, the misperception. Yeah, you're going to have to speak out more. I'm sorry, yeah. because people in the back will be able to hear. I'm going to sort of project upward and outward. <laughs> sorry. Uh, about Mongolia, Mongolia is a, a, is a huge uh, landlocked country with a population of like less than 3 million people. And the, uh, uh, there is almost uh, no foreign correspondents in Mongolia. Uh, most of them come from uh, Beijing Bureau or KL Malaysia or Seoul Bureau. And, uh, Actually, the most of those uh, film crews and TV crews, they actually come from Mongolia on holiday. <laughs> the uh, editors of the, they say, okay, you have a week of holiday, but do this kind of story or something. So they come on holiday, but and they, uh, usually they go to a countryside, go to the desert, and they, <coughs> spend an overnight with an animal herd, this family, and, uh, and, and the, how they picturize Mongolia to the outer world is they, they just uh, don't uh, men riding a horse, uh, driving a uh, goat, cashmere goats, and, and uh, <laughs> I want them to I uh, wanted them to um, more uh, look at the urbanization stories in Mongolia uh, because the uh, city population is booming and there's a uh, big mass migration from countries like the urban uh, cities. And there is also environmental concerns, <coughs> big, big uh, environmental pollution. Air pollution, air pollution, and uh, and uh, actually, I met one uh, uh, AP guy in Mongolia, and I asked him why uh, AP stories on Mongolia usually say that Mongolia is a country of three million. People, but the half of them are animal hunters. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "No, I don't write that. Editors in Beijing they put that sentence in there." Yeah, well, that's interesting. You said one of the most interesting pictures that uh, people seem to think of, outside people seem to remember from Mongolia is the iconic one where they show um, uh, a guy who's a sheep herder in in the middle of um, the steps, you know, with yeah. a with a computer and a girl next to him, you know, he's like. Nomadic <laughs> civilization that uh, is uh, is of course the one of the top reasons that foreigners are coming to Mumbai. But uh, we are changing. You know? We are changing. There is more uh, urbanization. <coughs> And the city has the city's population has gone up to over a million in just a few years. There's a big migration. Mm -hmm. But these kind of issues are also the most immediate to look at all. Yeah. That's great. So um, it's Mongolia is not just about Kashmir and goats. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about East Timor? What's an, what's an exciting issue about East Timor that people may maybe haven't covered enough? 
or identify? I think before, before early, every people in the world know East Timor about the countries still have violence. <coughs> During 24 hours fighting with Indonesia. And then after, after this, in the 99, everybody know who is East Timor, where. But I think uh, my, my colleagues here don't know where is East Timor. Of course. <laughs> 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 of course, in Indonesia, between Australia and then Indonesia. How many people do know where East Timor? Now I know. <laughs> yes. In the 99, we, uh, we are got independence by Indonesia, from Indonesia, uh, of course, helped by the United Nations. Called by Council, Popular Consultation. And then, because we have two, two groups fighting during the 24 hour, uh, 24 year. Some is pro Indonesian, and then some is won't get independent. And then, after the celebration, the popular consultation, 25% is won't be independent. And then, what happened? Fighting. During the one year, we fight fighting because the laws, the group laws, don't satisfy us about the result of the consultation, and then they fight it until one year. After this, you went coming, United Nations coming with the uh, other colleagues, other uh, uh, friends from the whole country, from Europe, from uh, Asia, come to help us. So you've got a nation that's almost only less than almost 10 years old, right? Yes. So what are some of the issues that are really interesting about a, a country that's, you know, so young? You know, it's like, like new country, very, very, very uh, problem, problem to, to establish in the country at the moment. When you come to a new country, the one thing you must do is to establish the uh, regulation and law. You know, during the during the one year, what one six months, we every people political political part and other group discussing about our constitution. We must do, we must set up our constitution first, and then after that, we don't have resources to build to build the country. And then how to do? It? We ask the many country to help. We call the donor group to help us to bring the money. Uh, the country is very popular with Timor and then got a lot of money for our country, Japan. Is Japan. They are help us so many uh, uh, funding and then we use this funding to build our system. And then of, of course the, the, the government building. And then after a uh, UN administration, we got in the UN Hanover everything to the East Timor 2002. And then everybody knows East Timor because mostly, most uh, famous people come, including Bill Clinton and other, other uh, leaders in the world come to participate in the first time we uh, declare uh, independent. After, after, after this, we still have problem because how to uh, manage the mentality with our people because our people is thinking about the fighting, about the violence. And so, you know, it's the, country, the country like our and then the, the country like com uh, country, country conflict and then after post, post conflict, their no mentality is not to, not, uh, how to say? Unified? They are to, to unify because they are thinking about the fighting. I see. So that's pretty interesting. And this is a problem for um, small countries in some sense, is the, uh, establishing links to the global network uh, and, 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 and asserting their position within the global order. And I think that's pretty interesting because we have a couple of people here from small nations, right? Um, Brunei is one. Do um, you want to talk a little bit about Brunei? <laughs> Just want to ask if anyone knows any, where Brunei is? <laughs> because a lot of people don't know where it is. Um, very small country. I see one hand. <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, very small country, very small population. There's only like um, 400,000, so that's not a lot. 
Um, our government um, system is a constitutional monarchy. It's a very conservative um, Islamic country. So chances are you won't get any nightclubs, you don't get to drink alcohol. Um, so there's not much entertainment going on there. Um, you have an outsized uh, world in a, a global energy, right? How much uh, um, oil does Brunei produce? <laughs> actually not a lot because it is trying to save because it knows that it will run out. Mm -hmm. So in a few years, I think, there's not a lot of time left. So it's trying to diversify its economy. So is that the big issue? It's like um, yes, trying it's to go out of being a petro, depending on petrodollars into Yes, that. yes. That, that's the biggest problem because most of the citizens feel that, oh, it's still around, so we can still laser, you know, not do anything and you know it's easy money you know coming in for the economy um, but what a lot of people don't know is that ha more than half of the um, country is covered by rainforest so there's not actually a lot of urban development going on there um, we have a, um, a remote area which is mostly covered by rainforest but it's very big in ecotourism. Mm. So that's how the government is promoting ecotourism. Um, but the problem is, I mean, once a tourist comes you know, for ecotourism, are they going to come back? So that's something that they, you know, they have to think about. Um, and there are some you know, news about how our, um, our king or our sultan is one of the wealthiest uh, people in the country. Uh, it is true, um, but a lot of people don't know that he's actually very generous. He's very, very generous. Um, whenever there's a festive occasion going on, he would open uh, his doors to his palace, and the citizens would get to meet him, shake hands with him, you know, mingle with him, and they get free food too. Like good food? Or? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I remember I asked you about this. Don't they have a free amusement park? They, yeah, that? they used to, but it's pretty run down. You know, it's terrible conditions now. So th that's a shame, really. Mm -hmm. um, and we get free health care. We get free education. So there's great social welfare benefits. Yeah. That's why it's a very peaceful country. <laughs> well, what about, um, let's see, another small place, Singapore. What's interesting about that? You guys have free health care? Right, uh, first and foremost, uh, I guess what I have to say is that besides tree income and economy, there are many fascinating things to learn about Singapore. Uh, the country is at a crossroads. Uh, economically, it's trying to find a new model for growth. Uh, politically, government is grappling with you know, citizens' desire for more space. Socially, um, a lot of fault lines are appearing uh, in terms of religion and uh, between races. Uh, it's the last part that I'd like to elaborate on, uh, on social changes. Uh, everyone thinks that Singapore is a, we are known for being a multicultural, multi-religious society. But uh, because of globalization, you know, we went on a very large scale immigration drive <coughs> in the last few years. So now we have a lot of undercurrents, seeming tensions. And most recently, there was a very heated debate on uh, homosexual rights. Because in Singapore, homosexual acts is uh, criminalized. Uh, so after a lot of uh, pseudo debates in Parliament, the laws, the law didn't go away. But now we see uh, religious groups. Recently, there was a case of religious groups sort of infiltrating into non-governmental organisations, which are supposed to be secular, to uh, try to impose their views on society. And you see the gays and gay activists trying to fight back. So things like this are making a very interesting time. So, right, so we've got everything from urbanization to um, forests and, and, and tourism, ecotourism, to gay rights, and we've just gone in a few countries. I'm going to open this up to the floor right now um, and see if anyone has any questions or points they want to raise. Yep. Hi, my name is Stephanie, and um, I'm wondering, especially for those that are from the smaller countries, um, have you run into any problems trying to cover events? Um, I know earlier, the young lady in the bar was talking about how um, there's not a lot of party going on because it's mainly an Islamic country, I believe she said. Yeah. Um, but like, if you're trying to cover like an underground, you know, music selling thing, like, are you ever scared that you're going to get 
um, your neighbors in trouble, like the government or whoever's in charge. Okay. Um, you know, the, the strange thing about Brunei is it's a conservative country, but we're very big in pirated DVDs. <laughs> it, it's like a hub for pirated DVDs. So <laughs> a lot of tourists actually go there to buy you know, pirated DVDs, and that's actually a shame. It's not something that you should be proud of. Um, I think partying, I mean, you do have some underground partying, but um, you can't really find it, you can't find much of it because there's police crackdowns. So they're very particular about these things, um, especially because Muslims are, you know, they can't drink, you know. Um, I think for a journalist co um, covering news like these, it's particularly challenging because we don't have free access to information. So, um, we have to get um, different ways, you know, to get our sources, our documents. So it, it's pretty challenging. Yeah. It's so sometimes, you know, you run into circles and you don't get anywhere. So I guess the question, the wider question can be thrown to all of you, not just the people who spoke before, but your question being, do you, as a journalist and <coughs> in, in operating in your country, um, um, encounter any difficulties performing a test, um, doing what you do? And um, I think Maki had some interesting points. We were talking about um, uh, being a journalist in the Philippines is a pretty dangerous profession, right? Well, that's what they say. Yeah. yeah. Well, well it's around the country. Philippines is a democratic country. So we have relatively free media. We can actually print or air any stories if we want to. I host a show, it's a weekly show. It's Reporter's Notebook. And it feels mostly about, you know, exposés on government corruption, but, <coughs> and this is a study made by a group based in New York. It's Committee to Protect Journalists, yes, CPJ. Yeah, yeah CPJ. Uh, we're second next to Iraq, uh, at least to the number of journalists killed, and we don't have a war. It's because uh, when reporters do stories about corruption, especially in the provinces, not necessarily in the urban areas. They're targeted for um, uh, <coughs> yeah. they get assassination. Assassination. <laughs> so we have a lot of those. That's one, actually that's one of the issues uh, of media in the Philippines right now. Staying alive. <laughs> um, any 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 other questions or follow-ups? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. do you guys report <coughs> international stories to your readership or viewers in your countries? Or <coughs> I don't know whether you guys have foreign correspondents stationing in the states. I, I wasn't very clear. So. Well, I do. Uh -huh. I'm based in Manila, so I deal with national stories right. in the Philippines, uh -huh. but. We also send reporters, for example, to the US or the Middle East or China or Japan that when Philippine <coughs> issues Filipino issues are tackled. So, so what do you think are some of the issues about America that are of particular interest to the Philippine audience? Well a lot. Well that's actually that's one of the failings of American media. Because post 9 eleven they're so concentrated on terrorism. So when they talk about the Philippines, uh, American media would go to my country, for example, and they would talk about the Abu Sayyaf. I don't know if you've heard of the Abu Sayyaf. That's uh, a terrorist group. I don't. I, I don't even consider. Them, I don't even consider them as terrorists. I think of them as like a ba bandits, criminals. But Amer American media has portrayed them into such a big terrorist cell. So that's what they see. And when there are a lot of issues in the Philippines, for example, trafficking trafficking of women and children, and a lot of Filipinas are actually victims of that. They're taken, for example, to Brunei, to Malaysia, to the Middle East, and no one actually reports about that. At least from, we report about it, but not other, well, not American media. Mm -hmm. We talk about <coughs> terrorism a lot, so. so. I'm sorry, I wanted to ask a question. So um, for, I guess this is something that a lot of American journalists face a face these days because not many readers or viewers tend to care so much about international issues. They're so um,
caught up with what's going on in their own world, they don't really seem to care so much about what's going on in the other countries. And I'm pretty sure when the economic conditions are dire, that's usually the trend in almost out in every country, I would assume. So how do you make connection with your viewers or readers uh, to connect them with the other parts of the world? How do you, what kind of approach do you take to get them connected to the story? Um, yeah, for anyone like who does the Maybe I could jump in here a, a little bit. Um, I was thinking it's an interesting point you made there about people being increasingly more national. But uh, that said, um, when I first moved to cover China, and this was six years ago, if you Google China, then you wouldn't like so many hits. Now you have so many hits, you have to segregate it. So the world, to my mind, is getting a little bit more global because a lot of things that happen in China as a China correspondent affect America now. Um, and it can be anything from the economy, the production of cars has shifted primarily from Detroit and <coughs> cities to uh, a lot of that's in China now. Uh, a lot of production of goods. We, when you have to have <coughs> cars, everything that stretched from a factory in southern China and it would go all the way to your pet food <coughs> you know, lying on your kitchen floor and, and then the chain would go so far and people would care what was happening all the way down the line. And then that was, you know, so we are an increasingly global audience and I think um, particularly, what's particularly interesting about the fact that we are a global audience is that now that the American media is in a, you know, in a bit of an economic tailspin, we are starting to see uh, an assertion of other news organizations that are hiring more. Um, are you, I mean, Al Jazeera now is, is in a big, one of the big places. If you're an aspiring journalist now, um, if you were looking for a job, <laughs> somehow, especially on television, you know, there's a lot of Al Jazeera uh, networks that are hiring. Um, and um, so, for example, um, you don't care is from China, and, um, and and you know a lot of Chinese news organizations are expanding overseas. Uh, they have how many is it in Africa? <coughs> About twenty. We they have, have twenty bureaus. They, they have twenty Africa. bureaus in Africa. Yes. Yesterday we were at LA. It's a long, it's a long tradition. You know, it's not just related to China. It's the impact on on Africa continent. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think China is different from the U.S. Uh, scenario, which is that uh, to decrease this foreign coverage, uh, China is increasing its foreign in reporting sc scheme, including my news agencies, the state news, news agencies called the Tsinghua News Agency, also the CCTV, <coughs> China Central Television, and the China Daily, and all these uh, the major media outlets are increasing their uh, overseas distributions. Uh, for instance, the late, uh, in, recent, uh, uh, in a recent reform of uh, CCTV, they are adjusted their morning uh, broadcasting, and uh, you can see that they put a lot of focus on the international reporting uh, at the 7, uh, seven o'clock uh, uh, program. Uh, the first the three items are closely related with the international topics such as the G20 and uh, and such such kind of change such things. So I think China is, is the emerging as a power and uh, and it, it wants to wants to, to hear the international voice. Also, it wants to that like, is voice heard by the other countries as well. So that is why we want to uh, China wants to distribute and uh, elevate. It's voiced to a uh, to a much higher standard, and by <coughs> both personnel and resources. And uh, in terms of uh, the U.S. media's <coughs> reportage on China, I think that one one problem I perceive is, is that China is not what the traditional uh, stereotype of China it is. Actually, the day before, I visited a family here before, and the couple, they were very kind. But actually, I found that they almost knew anything about the contemporary China. They asked me, hey, you, you are still for, uh, enjoying the free medical service? I told them, no, now we are actually uh, burdened by three new mountains. One is the, is the medical care we have to shoulder ourselves. One is education and one is the housing. They are, they are quite like, quite like the, the capitalist uh, 
capitalistic uh, practice. So it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the present China. It's different from the uh, China back to 60 years ago, or it's different from the uh, 1989 when the Tiananmen Square event broke out. And uh, I think China is very complicated, but it's, it, you, we have many stories that could be done on, on China. I, one of my impre most interesting <coughs> stories uh, written by American journalists is, is the story carried by time. It's called Me Generation. I'm, I'm, I don't know whether you have read, read that about. It's about the, the, uh, the youth gener generation, and uh, they are very, I mean, the urban citizens, uh, the, they are children, they are, they are children are very wealthy, <coughs> and they have a lot of material access, uh, success, but they are very self-centered. Self they don't care about politics. They don't care about the, the other people. They just care about themselves. I think such this is a problem that China is, is, is uh, facing. And uh, I think such stories uh, is done on a rational basis. It's not just uh, stigmatizing China. Uh, it imposes some problems we are facing, but it's uh, based <coughs> on reason and facts. I think such stories are worth uh, uh, praising. That's a great point. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else want to raise a point? Or? Well, okay, well, let's hear from this side because we've been a little quiet on this side too. Um, and um, we have some. Eleanor, you're from Fiji, and that's a place that I think many of us wish we had gone to or had a chance to go to. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit what, what it's like to be a reporter in Fiji? Well, as I've said earlier, we um, currently um, under on uh, media censorship because uh, they had a coup d'etat in um, 2006. They overthrew the elected government. So in April, we threw away a constitution after a court ruling saying that the dictatorship was illegal. So uh, since then, we've had censors coming into our newsrooms every evening after we do our stories. <coughs> I come from, uh, I work for a newspaper, it's a news corp uh, company. So, you know, with the newspapers, we have our deadlines at six, but every day we have to have a backup page one, at least five stories to backup page one. If we have news pages, you have to have backup pictures, and even up to the world pages. They don't like us uh, showing pictures or stories of terrorists in other countries, Somalia, or which is sometimes irrelevant to Fiji, but we have to do all happy stories for <laughs> boring stories for, for the whole newspaper, practically. So every, every evening, it's, it's a tough job because, you know, after you write your story, after you've done all your questioning, you're, you're chasing somebody for the whole day, and the story might not go. So, um, uh, apparently, our dictator is following a China model. He visits China a lot. So he tells us, you know, the Chinese journalists are very good. They're not like you people. They <laughs> <laughs> cause trouble. <laughs> so I mean, we have gone to the wrong people. But anyway, so he's trying to introduce a decree that um, will make each journalist have, um, you need a license to write. So so to speak. So it's, it's very tough. You have to be creative. You have to write stories that will make people read between the lines now. You know, mm -hmm. instead of just saying everything, putting it up, you have to make them read between the lines. And um, uh, we've had at least three of our publishers in the last six months deported back to their countries because they were not from, they're not Fiji citizens. Uh, um, Australians, so our dictator is a bit paranoid about foreigners in the country, so he assumes that the publisher, though he doesn't have any role in the editorial running of things, has, uh, is making all the reporters write all these bad stories, which he, which he thinks is bad stories. Anyway, so we are on to our um, third publisher, she's a female, and uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed, 
but she seemed to have survived. And, um, well, no, but, they, but for foreign correspondents that are coming in, chances are you'll be deported even before you get out of the airport. So anybody looking for a quick trip to Fiji? <laughs> That's a I, I just have a question. Um, I actually read a piece recently online, um, a news site called Mother Jones. Um, and it was um, it was an article about Fiji specifically. Yeah, Fiji Water Bottling Company. Have you read the article? Yes, I did. Yeah, I was just curious, like, um, how does your dictator feel about you um, reporting on, like, American business in your country? Or if not, not even necessarily that, but, like, you know, I know you said you're not allowed to write anything that's not happy, but things that are affecting your community that you want change, <clears throat> you know, or, or how did you feel about that story? I know not everyone in the room is familiar with it, but. Th that is actually a good story. <coughs> that was a really good story. I think you should describe it to the uh, Okay, this American journalist, uh, female, came over to Fiji to do stories on Fiji water. Fiji water is one, is almost, is now the second largest um, foreign exchange earner in Fiji um, after tourism. And so um, this reporter went right, this uh, bottling company is actually in the interior. I don't know how they found it, but it's really way deep inside. And so she did stories and in Fiji because of the paranoia of these bloggers. Mm -hmm. you know how, because they've censored the media, blog sites have popped up and they've sort of told the real stories of things happening around the country. Uh, police brutality, people being taken in, and so on. And so what the government has done is placed um, uh, people in civilian clothes around internet shops. So they would monitor whoever is. And you have to have an ID and to show where you're from or what. And, and so she was in an internet shop. And somebody just asked a question. So how it's like in Fiji, she was chatting with somebody. And in a few minutes, Somebody had uh, taken, uh, somebody came and told her, you're writing bad stories about Fiji water and so, so forth, and took her in to the police station and kept her there. And so... Um, what was the story about in the end? Uh, she did her story when she reached the States. Uh, and it was about? It, well, it was about Fiji water, and she was trying to expose the fact that, well, the supposed fact, if, if you will, I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I read comments well, she, to the post that she was saying were refuting on how Fiji water was doing this, and and at least half the population of Fiji, rural population, didn't have piped water, and that by supporting Fiji, <coughs> because Obama drinks Fiji water, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was like yes. supporting the interim regime because it's the largest foreign exchange earner. If you're going to to make the dictator get back and get back to dem democracy, you have to ban all this. Uh, and because Fiji Water, though it's the largest um, foreign exchange earner, they enjoy tax-free status. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And so that lady was taken in, but um, the American embassy was really quick. <coughs> Within minutes, it was there at the police station. And typical. Mark here. Yeah, I was going. Uh, I was. Going to ask, and you alluded to the situation in your country mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, how the internet is policed, uh, or at least the internet shops are. I imagine there's uh, other policing that goes on. And we've read uh, there's been a lot of writing about what the relative freedom and restrictions are in China. I was just curious from some of the other <coughs> here where there is. Uh, any, any of the reporters here who are operating in a place where uh, press freedom is restricted, um, I'd be interested to know to what degree the, uh, the web serves as an alternative or, or not. Um, can, can it, does it function as an alternative source of information for the population, or is it also as Policed as uh, presses. Anyone want to jump in? Uh, for Singapore, <coughs> our press is uh, we don't have press freedom, so the internet to some 
people think that it's a great democratization tool. But so far, it's not working as well as uh, the proponents think it should. Um, the reason is, uh, in Singapore, a unique situation is that the government for a while has been thinking about how to deal with the internet. In Singapore, internet is free, you, know, you can say anything you want, although <clears throat> some bloggers have been arrested for uh, supposedly um, putting up seditious uh, statements uh, inciting racial hatred. That's the line of the government. Uh, but politically speaking, they are quite free to say whatever they want. So I think the government has set on a strategy. This is not official, but from what we can sense is that they are tightening control on the government media to act as a sort of an opponent to the online media. So you see a polarization of the whole media landscape. Uh, so in that sense, people are, most people, I don't, I might, for my friends, we don't want to get in, involved in, we know there's a lot of things said on the internet, but there's a lot of angst, a lot of misinformation, uh, and people are more interested in slamming the government than engaging in constructive debate, which is quite frustrating for people who are already, you know, uh, in, really want to encourage a freer media, a more free media. Yeah, so I think it takes time for Singaporeans especially to learn how to debate constructively, looking at issues without slamming the government. What about Vietnam? Uh, I think it's quite the same in Vietnam. Well, actually, we are a communist country, so uh, every uh, media outlet is state-owned. We often joke that uh, we have uh, 600 media outlets, including newspapers, television station, and so on. And 600 media outlets and one editor in chief. <laughs> That's because um, we have this uh, kind of. This is uh, my word. We you have uh, driving under influence in Vietnam. We have writing under influence. That means um, uh, you are closely monitored on what you are writing and reporting. And we have weekly meeting. Um, to see uh, what you have done in the past week, what you should have done this week, and um, to stop for the reporting on uh, issues that the government uh, don't want to don't want you to do. So, um, in the past few years, there have been an increase in uh, bloggers who have done a very great job in uh, reporting from another side. Uh, giving an alternative perspective to issues which are not covered or which are covered um, under influence on uh, far more newspapers, on official newspapers. Are these bloggers anonymous or are they known? Uh, well, uh, it's not the same like in Fiji, in Vietnam, they are known. And uh, that's their problem because uh, quite a few uh, have been arrested but the reason uh, stated by uh, government is tax evasion or some very silly reason. But we know that uh, they were arrested because they uh, 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 featured their ideas uh, against the, co the government's policy in dealing with uh, issues. That's why they were arrested. Any other comments? Or? I, I would ch actually, since we've um, I would actually like to turn it the other way around and, and let our guests here uh, ask questions to the audience. You've been in America for a while now. Are there observations or, or questions or you know that you want to share with our audience about what you see and what you know and whether or not these things are different from your perceptions or, or For example, you've, you've observed American media while well, you've been here for a bit. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Maki, I know you have some interesting thoughts on this one. Oh no, we were just discussing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, yeah, I'd like to, um, I've looked through the newspapers. I'm just wondering, on what are your thoughts on human interest angles? You know, there's a lot of things that you know, people would read. Um, for us, we, we've, my editor has always said that if you write about, you take a human angle, it's, it's going to, interest your readers. I'm just looking through the newspapers and then we are through Skid Row and I'm just trying I to see how you tackle issues. I, I'll take a shot at it. I personally think that that's a flaw. Mm -hmm. um, there's not really, in my opinion, I don't think that there's enough in our media, at least in the forefront, like you really have to dig for it. Like that article um, that I just mentioned about Fiji, like that is, such a human 
article and there's so much life in it and so little life in it in the same breath, you know? And I think that that's a problem that American media is facing. And personally, I'd like to ask you guys a question in return. I mean, like, how do you feel about American media, American media and like, what do you think are some faults? Like, can you just name a few for us? You know, like, just, I mean, some things that you have seen within a few weeks of being here, you've seen throughout your lifetime that really stick out as a you that we as the younger generation of journalists should take into account. Can I just, uh, well, you mentioned something about it's, it was difficult to dig into a, you know, nicer stories, yeah. I mean, more in-depth stories, because we've been going around, you know, media outlets, and I had this impression that it was like a chicken and egg thing, that's why um, American media would cover more about, uh, what's his name, John and Johnny plus eight. Because uh, <laughs> that's what the American audience wants to, uh, I don't know, watch or hear about. or you know. So I was actually surprised that there was that kind of sentiment because uh, I had the impression, I was, you know, I've been creating this kind of impression that, uh, American audience has been getting shallower because if there's such a huge coverage about Michael Jackson, for example, and that kind of coverage, your healthcare issues do not get. I mean, they don't get that kind of coverage or that much in depth because they keep on saying that, you know, the American audience do not want this anyway, so why should we do this? So, you know, it's like a chicken and egg thing, especially now that they're facing financial crunch since no one would read about that, no one would you know, uh, watch that anyway, so. That's interesting, I mean, the point, oh, I mean, it's probably a, a commercial, I mean, most uh, media here is purely commercial, so the feeling is that, on the other hand, there's a, you gotta give what your readership wants. But on the other hand, there's this tension, too, because American media also views itself as a, as a thought leader, you know, uh, and so there's, there's always been this sort of tension, which is particularly strong now because of the economic crisis. But I want to sort of flip this around a little bit and sort of say, okay, you guys practice media in Asia, and you know, certain practices are different. One of them being the commercial structure model. Some of you are all state funded and so on. And I sort of wanted to flip around and see, is there anything that American media can learn from journalistic pr practices in Asia? I mean, you're here, you're going around seeing um, all these journalist schools here. And is there anything that you guys think that you can teach them? Okay, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think this is, I want to frame this as a way of uh, me teaching what you guys should do, but to touch on Marty's point, I sense that there's a sort of a personality obsession in America because of the media's coverage. Like for example, even for healthcare, a lot of it is centered on Obama. Uh, and for example, yeah, in a David Adams case, I, I mean, I was watching TV, reading news, sometimes I feel like that's over-analyzing, you know, of, of certain personalities. So I don't know, because in, in Asia, in Singapore in particular, we take a very uh, detached kind of coverage. I don't know whether it's good or bad, we can debate about it separately, but you know, you don't really, a person is not seen as a person. You know, you, you always think of it as a corporate entity. You know, if it's a politician, we talk about the government. Uh, if it's a CEO, it's the company. That's very, not as much attention on the personality. Yeah, so and more focus on the issues. Yeah. <coughs> That's a great point. Um, Anything else, you guys? Come on. Can you ask a question? Sure. Um, do you buy newspaper every day? No. <laughs> the circulation. Taiwan <laughs> 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 yeah. is a small country, but uh, free uh, and uh, interesting. So that's our crisis. My danger is not to be killed, it's to be laid off. <laughs> <laughs> that's another kind of death. <laughs> yeah. That's something we haven't <laughs> Can the income of the fresh graduate yeah. they work in uh, if they work for media, what is the income average income? Mm -hmm. What did you ask? Do you know average the income of uh, yeah, I, I think everybody's very, I guess everybody's interested here because they've come to see American colleges and, and they, they're all amazed at the uh, fees, <laughs> tuition fees, and um, our two guests here <laughs> want to know how much in, is it would be the average income of a first year journalist? Well, um, <laughs> I think I can answer the question. Well, I work, I'm a broadcast major, and I did work in adaptation for 
So the first year I actually had a paying job, it was twenty thousand. So that would there they would not even cover the tuition and living expenses that I owe now. That, that, that's uh, that's on the yeah. low side. I mean, yeah, entry level. level. But it, it, it's very it's very difficult to generalize. But to generalize, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, uh, unless unless you're going to a very elite institution, uh, which is uh, not usually the case. Uh, the, I think that a figure of around thirty-five thousand dollars is is probably what you're talking about, and it could be more. It could be a little bit less than that. Uh, could be a little bit more than that. Could be thirty-five to forty-five, and then if you're going to a more elite institution, it could be twice that. The, the way things are going, just a couple of observations. Uh, we went to visit the Los Angeles Times, and so we'd arranged to have a a tour of the paper, and uh, uh, as we were waiting in the lobby, uh, my friend who had arranged this called me up and said, uh, would you mind, what we're going to do is combine your tour with the uh, a tour for new employees. <laughs> <laughs> so as I was walking through the city room, I ran into old friends at the paper, and, I, and they said, wow, this is your group here? And I said, well, no, part of it is our group of Asian journalists. The other part are new employees, and several people go, we've got new employees? <laughs> 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 yeah, but to be fair, all those new employees were all in circulation and advertising. They were not uh, mostly um, in reporting. Yeah. So. And, and the other cultural difference, too, or societal difference as well, when we went to Skid Row, we were talking, and we, and we had a uh, big day before on, on the homeless issues and all. Uh, Eleanor, as we were walking around, was saying, uh, we were talking about the homeless issue in, in each of the various countries, and I was saying that, well, in Fiji, she know, they, they know all the homeless people in Fiji, unlike <laughs> the large numbers that we have here. I think it's, um, it's good to be a small country. <laughs> <laughs> and so, if you see somebody's relative that's walking around looking homeless, you can just say, hey, I saw your cousin there, what you, you people not, uh, Looking after him or what? Eleanor, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, would you have to worry if you were to be quoted saying some of the things that you said here? Would yeah. you have to worry about that when you return to Fiji? Uh, no, that's a funny thing. Most our editors have usually gone out of the country and said, every day you know what to say. And they'll come back into the country. But it's only when they're right. in the country. It's about yeah. influencing people inside. I guess it's what they read. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear anybody else here. I want to hear something from Roland. Um, what do you want to hear? <laughs> 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 You're the only one I haven't heard speak of. Maybe you can talk about how you find this stuff. Oh, yes. Stories about the billion dollar scale. Um, well, I know most of you are my PhD as well. Papua New Guinea is a very. Papua New Guinea is a very resource rich. Bigger than. Uh, it's quite bigger than uh, Fiji. But. Uh, <laughs> Uh, what can I say? Uh, corruption. Uh, corruption is, I guess, uh, eating away the country very much. Our, <coughs> our prime minister is a very corrupt prime minister, I can probably say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he was a marvel foundation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, I guess that's one reason why we do have, uh, we don't have homeless people, but we have poverty in our country. Um, there's people who are hungry, they don't have food to eat, they don't go to school. Um, just because most of the money that they deserve is being misused by the Prime Minister and his, uh, yeah, his parliamentarians. <coughs> so uh, basically, that's what we have been trying to do all this time. I mean, the media has been very vocal on uh, corruption in the country. We, we try to speak about it, we report every, in, every little corruption that's happening. And um, apparently it is, uh, <coughs> I mean, it's a very corrupt country, so when we report uh, corruption that's going on, um, the court system, the judicial system tries to step in to um, solve the problems or whatever uh, corruption that we report on. Okay. When it gets to them, the Prime Minister can easily go and just 
give him so much money. I mean, yeah, they influence the uh, judicial system. So they keep their mouth shut. Uh, any inquiry, investigations that start to end on a day. So, do journalists who, who expose this corruption do they experience any physical dangers, such as in? Uh, oh, um, from where I come from, our journalists are uh, okay. We don't. They don't, I'm like uh, Philippines and elsewhere where they kill the journalists. Um, in Papua New Guinea, we just receive threats. <laughs> yeah. We receive threats from. Uh, what, was the most, uh, what was the biggest threat you ever got? Um, I reported a story, a political story about uh, apparently someone who came back to our media organization and is working with us right now. But he left the. Uh, where I was working, and uh, <coughs> he went into the political uh, R&D campaign for something, and I made a report about him, and his supporters came back. And what so did they try to do to you? They told me not to go around to the area. That's, that's all they told me. They said, um, if you come around here, you'll be bashed out. Mm -hmm. BNG is, is, is a rich country. It's got gold, a lot of mineral resources, and gas. It's supposed to be a much, much more developed. Oil and gas. What's the average income in PNG? Okay, so um, it's about 1 o'clock now, and I know a lot of you have to go. Um, I'm just going to leave it open for uh, maybe one or two more comments as time allows. So, yep, you don't have something yeah, to say? Yeah, I'd like to share one, one ex personal experience. Uh, I know that the, I don't know whether you, the graduates from the school will be dispatched to a foreign country yeah. to do as the foreign workers. My experience is that the don't easily jump into a conclusion you have to get to understand the local countries, the cultures and the social systems, the, and the policies as well to build your stories into a context. Otherwise, the, you just impose the, your American values into your reporting. That is dangerous. Yeah. Yes. Don't think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because the, um, um, how do you say, this July I was in, I was in Xinjiang to do the Wurundji riots reporting. I was born there, but I, I left when I was nine years old. But actually, when I, I came back to my hometown, I found I know, almost knew, knew nothing about the, 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 the history and the, 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 the Han and the Yugo conflict throughout the, 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 the histories. So I, I, I was forced to read a lot before I write something. Otherwise, I, I, would, I, would, I would feel that my reporting was void, losing, having nothing substantial. So uh, I, one of my suggestions is to, to get into the people and uh, get into the community you, you are living and to throw away your preoccupied uh, values and uh, mingle with the people there. That is the best way. Basically, not do parachute reporting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's a great note to finish on. That is indeed. Thank you so much. You all shared a lot of wisdom with us. It was a great